Do you remember the first time that you saw him uh, perform live? Uh, or the first time you heard him? They, it really resonated either way. The first time I heard him, I guess with Billy Cobham. Wow, that's uh, the first time just about anybody heard yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I was a, a huge fan of that scene. You know, uh, it's funny because, you know, we've been doing uh, a lot of interviews about this tour and about the record and stuff. And I guess some people are surprised that myself or Matt Apps or Alan Woody would be as into jazz and, and jazz oriented stuff and fusion and stuff like that as we are and were. Um, but most of the musicians that I grew up playing with pursued that at least for a little while. Uh, and I think musicians in general owe it to themselves to kind of study the best of the best of every genre you can open your mind to. Uh, I never considered myself a jazz musician, but jazz was always a big part of everything that I listened to and, and a big part of my overall view of things and, and philosophy, uh, musically speaking. But I was, you know, I was writing songs and, and, and concentrating on singing and other things that, that kind of took precedent, but it was always kind of a, a big motivation for me so I studied that music a, a lot. You know, I was in bands in the 70s that played Cobham music and Return to Forever and Weather Report and, and uh, Ma Vishnu. I mean, we may have butchered some of it, but we, we tried to play it. Uh, but I remember hearing John and thinking, wow, this guy's got a, an interesting take. He doesn't sound like anybody else. Tonally, melodically, uh, phrasing coming from a different place and playing behind the beat like Dexter Gordon. I was like... Uh, uh, this is my kind of guitar mm -hmm. player. Uh, wow. Well, uh, that says a lot about you right there, because most uh, uh, guitar players don't even know who Dexter Gordon is, you know? And, uh, yeah, thanks. Man. Well, and you know what? And I remember the first time we were hanging in Atlanta, and we were on the bus, and John says, uh, got any Muddy Waters? Like, uh, let's listen to some Muddy Waters. And it wasn't like, uh, like, Oh, I want to check that out. That was like that's your that's yeah, your home base. I, I say in a lot yeah. of ways, you know. I, I remember yeah. talking about BB and Albert King mm -hmm. and yeah. and stuff. And he genuinely loves blues, and I genuinely love jazz, even though it might shock someone. But I, I'm not sure why, because I think in our world, you should embrace all of it if you can. And, and I think, like you said, uh, everybody checks out good music you know when you're a serious musician so you're going to check out uh, jazz more or less if you're a, a, a musician in America today you're gonna get to that if you're serious you know and uh, Warren's a serious guitar player man you know and and he even though Warren says he's not a jazz musician he has the uh, aesthetic and and point of view uh, that jazz musicians have when he goes to blow on his guitar he tells a story, and the blues players played like that too. And he's not just shredding and running a bunch of stuff. Um, he's telling a story, which is is there in music outside of jazz, that point of view. And that's why we can play together. You know, and I think uh, if a musician is lucky enough to experience what it's like to play with other great musicians mm -hmm. and what it's like to tell a story when people are helping you tell that story. Mm. When you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when everybody's listening and, and it's it's building in a way that you couldn't possibly build it on your own, mm -hmm. that's really much more dimensional and much more depth than, uh, than any of us can create by ourselves. So that's the thing that I love about Government Mule. The Alma Brothers is that way. Mm -hmm. All of John's projects are that way because once you kind of experience that, you don't ever want to go back to the one dimensional uh, one dimensional linear kind of approach to play in you know uh, somebody asked me in a guitar magazine one time what determines a long solo like what you know how long you're gonna and I said well if you're playing with the right cats you can play forever and if you're playing with the wrong cats you're gonna stop pretty quick mm -hmm. you know it's just That's it's so just true. not fun so true when nobody's listening yeah, there's this thing that happens with the music that's very subtle, 
um, where we listen to each other and support each other when we're improvising together. And that allows the music to go on and on. And uh, that's why we have 25 minute tunes like <laughs> we, we do on there. And you know, it's not always great, but that's because once you've experienced playing with people that can do that and can allow that for, to happen for you, this is what Warren just said, you know, th there's nothing like it and you kind of can't go back again <laughs> to just playing the song or just shredding over a mindless band. You know, it becomes this unit and, and you're all playing together, there's nothing like it. And that's why I don't like to overdub my solos in the studio. I, I would much rather play the, the solo live on the take because the solos I wind up keeping or the ones that I really like are the ones where we're all in it together. And it's a, there's a musical conversation going on. And so if it was just me, I couldn't create something that uh, dimensional. You know? And sometimes it's not even as obvious as, as where I play something and and Warren plays the same thing back. It's about like, you know, each guy has his part and it's building together, you know, even though you're not playing the, and that, that sort of feeling, you know, it's like everybody's moving together. It's, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's, that's why tracks that are, you know, constructed at home of, uh, with overdubbing, different stuff might be great and the song might be great, but it doesn't have that thing that we have when we create it all together, you know? I mean, you mentioned sort of iconic players that, that John has played with. And if you look at both of your careers, I think of uh, Greg Allman, I think of Miles Davis as people certainly that are know that are, that are really some of the most significant, uh, I think, musicians. And work has resonance. And I was just wondering if maybe you each people would be interested to hear what you sort of took away from those two iconic players starting with you know John like looking back in terms of what you do today that to some degree you think is a reflection of what you did during your uh, your time with Miles well uh, I, I don't play the guitar without thinking about Miles Davis even if I'm not consciously thinking about him his uh, uh, influence on not just me but everybody in music coming out of jazz you know was so great he was always my favorite long before I played with him. And then getting to play with him and getting to, uh, you know, he gave me a lot of confidence that he liked what I did. But just getting to hear him every night, how he set himself up, and how, wh what a, uh, an incredible uh, strength he had in his convictions, musical convictions, um, was such a lesson. To, it changed my life playing with Miles. Was that, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious, you were relatively young out of yeah, Berkeley well, no, when I came around, about, No, I'd been around on the scene. I was 31. I'd been playing in, in, uh, in well-known bands for like six, seven, eight years, you know. I was 23 when I started, so I'd been around, yeah. But for Miles to, to get to play with him was the icing on the cake, you know. <laughs> was that, were you, were you intimidated <laughs> or just took it as a, you know, at that point I guess you just would take things as they uh, Yeah, what, you mean when Miles called me to play with him? Yeah. Oh man, I was nervous for the first year out of the four years I played in Miles' band. I was completely nervous the first whole first year. <laughs> I was thrilled. I mean, you know, he's still my favorite. You know, I, I just interviewed I interviewed John McLaughlin recently, mm, and, and he, he feels a lot the same way, right? He does, <laughs> and he would say though that Miles would give him very interesting, uh, interpretive, uh, abstract suggestions. Oh man, he would say the out of stuff. Yeah. Can you do? I'm just giving you guys anything that jumps that. Oh yeah, don't play what you know, play what you don't know. What the <laughs> hell does that mean? You know, Miles and these other guys like Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter, the real mo masters of modern music, they got into saying all this analogy, and they played like that too, you know, that some people I think, especially the people that are trying to really get the literal meaning of what they say, you know, might get confused by. Miles would say all kinds of great stuff, but then you'd think about what he said and you'd, re you'd get a feeling from it for what he was going for, because that's abstract stuff, you know. Miles also would say the most down-to-earth things, which I love, you know, as well. He, one time he, he said, uh, you know what jazz is? You learn as many phrases as you can and then you just play them. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, your experience with... Uh with Greg. Well, uh, with uh, the Allman Brothers Band, uh, 
I'm sure it's similar to John's experience with Miles in the way that I was a huge fan uh, before I ever met those guys and in some ways probably learned more from them before I met them mm. because I was such a, a fan. And then there are certain things that you can't learn until you get on the inside and experience it uh, in a more intimate level. But, um, you know, uh, I always said that if I had an opportunity to join a band that I grew up listening to, the Allman Brothers would have been at the, at the top of that list. And I learned so much from listening to that music, from playing that music in, in bands growing up, you know. Um, and having an opportunity to be part of that was a, an amazing ex experience, you know, but it's hard to, to separate uh, the amount of influence that that had on me before then and, 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 and afterward because uh, I guess our situations are a little different in the way that When I joined the Allman Brothers, I was, I think I was 27 or 28. I started playing with Dickie Betts when I was 26. Mm. And at that time, it was a very important time for me. I was just starting to embark on a career as a solo artist, starting to uh, sign my first record deal to make a record of my own, uh, which was the most important thing to me, was to make my own music and to sound like myself. I, uh, all of us as musicians and artists, our biggest mission is to find a voice, to create your own voice and something that's uniquely you. Um, so about the time I started working with, with Dickie, which led to me working with the Allman Brothers, I was having to decide as a 26, 27 year old person uh, where I fit in to music. The 80s had brought about some pretty bizarre music, but music like the Allman Brothers at that time was, a lot of people looked at it as being passe and, mm. and, and I think even predicted that it would never come back. Um, it was kind of gone. It was gone, yeah. When you yeah. joined the band. And, and, uh, and then I remember uh, I started playing with Dickie and then when the Allman Brothers came back, Robert Cray was doing right. well mm -hmm. stevie ray vaughn was doing well right and then on the other side of the world the grateful dead were doing well and i, I remember dickie and i having a conversation where he said you know we're somewhere in between that the the stevie ray robert cray and the grateful dead we're kind of in the middle of of that so maybe there is room for the allman brothers uh -huh. and and you know in his mind he didn't know if the allman brothers could come back so to speak you know but myself, as a, an, an artist, uh, I'm trying to think, well, the last thing I want to do is sound like someone else. I want to try and sound like myself. Uh, so as I was about to make my first record, I get a call saying, from Dickie Betts saying, I'm going to make a record. I want you to come write some songs with me and go in the studio and help me make this record. And it was a great band that, that we had that, that made that record. So I put my record off and then I was going to go make my record and they called and said, we want you to join the Allman Brothers. From that point forward, who I was was changing because now I wasn't someone that, that whose biggest mission was to sound like no one else. I had to kind of sound like I belonged in and that Allman band. Brothers, and know. they obviously chose me for a reason. And so I'm juggling how much of Dwayne Allman's influence do I want to insert into what I'm playing? How much do I want to go against the grain, you know? And the same as a writer and the same as a singer. Greg was a huge influence on me as a singer. Um, so finding myself in an iconic band like that kind of made me reconsider a lot of things starting with the fact that I was now inheriting an audience just by being in this great band. Some of that audience was now open to what I was going to do. Uh, so I didn't want to do something that sounded too much like the Allman Brothers but I also didn't want to do something that sounded too far removed from the Allman Brothers. So it was a, it was a tough spot to, to be in. Uh, I guess the moral of the story is uh, 
I thought I was joining for a year or two mm. years. Right. <laughs> I didn't think I was joining for 25 years. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, so every year uh, was a new riddle, you know, but how much influence that band had on me is impossible to determine, you know, because uh, I was such a fan. We all, all the cats I grew up with were huge, huge fans, you know. I was a huge Miles Davis fan too, but uh, that's John's question. <laughs>